Okay, we are continuing our series in this women and scripture and Christianity and women. We're on week four of this series and you know we're following the book written by Derek and Diane Tipple on the message of women, which I find very interesting to read. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, we know from that verse how we've discussed it over the previous weeks that uh, it appears that uh, Paul is quite clearly saying that all men and women are equal before God. And, uh, but that doesn't seem to be true in real life. So the other question that comes up in this study that we're doing about this equality sexual equality is, are all equal before man? Because that seems to be a prime issue in this study. Well, last week we looked at women and the kingdom, that's part one, and we looked at uh, Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus, who plays a prominent part in Jesus's ministry. And we realise that from verses like this. After this, Jesus travelled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Well, you see, verses like that show us quite clearly that lots of women followed Jesus in his ministry. The Tipple say, women are anything but invisible in the life and ministry of Jesus. They are prominent witnesses to the events of his life, faith, faithful disciples to the end, recipients of his grace, subjects of his teaching and beneficiaries of his justice. So part two then this week of uh, Women in the Kingdom, but we're looking of when women encounter Jesus in their lives. Josephus is a person I think you should know by now because I do mention him quite often. He's a Jewish historian. He's not, not a Christian, but he pick up lots of things from his uh, histories that he wrote around the time of Jesus. And one of the things he wrote was that women are in all things inferior to men. So it just goes to show that uh, women in Jesus's ministry were subject to that patriarchal authority, which didn't give them much freedom in life. They couldn't divorce their husbands. Only, div only husbands could divorce their wives. So they were often thought of uh, not educating and uh, men blame women for all the ills in society and especially when it came to the difficulties of keeping away from sexual temptation. It's always women's fault, of course. But Jesus shows us that he totally disregards such peer behaviour and adopts a revolutionary style when he meets up with women during his mission. The Gospels report several encounters with single vulnerable women, both in public and private. And uh, most importantly, lots of these women, after their encounter with Jesus, became his disciples and almost missionaries of the Gospel. The most wonderful thing, I think, is about we see in Jesus's ministry is the unembarrassed way he went about dealing with women that came across his path he always treats them whether they're on their own or in company with such dignity and worth 
and he never accuses them of sexual temptation as being, you know, the main primer mover of that. Like when he met the woman who was dragged before her in the act of adultery. G's appreciation of the worth of women was more than just theoretical. It was practical and he freely and loving encompassed women in his mission and gave them great leadership roles in life. So women, the first one woman we're gonna look, about, look at under this title of the women encounters with Jesus is the suffering of the woman with persistent bleeding. Remember this. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So the incident with the woman who was persistently bleeding for 12 years. Jesus is on his way to Capernaum to uh, minister to Jairus, his daughter. Jairus was a prominent leader in Capernaum and uh, was understand that she was dying. Yet this woman comes up to him and just pushes herself through the crowd and uh, touches his cloak. And immediately Jesus senses his power being drained from him. And so he, he shouts out, who's touched me? And uh, he's ridiculed a bit by the disciples and those around him. How can you tell if somebody's just touched you? There's so many people crowded, but he knew it. And uh, this uh, woman thankfully owns up because she immediately feels after touching Jesus's cloak that she's healed and her bleeding has stopped. Mark's recording in his uh, account of this, how much this woman had suffered in body and mind and spirit, and also with tremendous in medical expenses. And of course, why was this so desperate for this woman to do such a thing? Well, because she, as a person that was always bleeding, she would have been unclean as little. When a woman has a regular flow of blood, the impurity of her monthly period will last seven days, and anyone who touches her will be unclean till evening. Anything she lies on during her period will be unclean, and anything she sits on will be unclean. Anyone who touches her bed will be unclean, they must wash their clothes and bathe with water, and they will be unclean till evening. Anyone who touches anything she sits on will be unclean. They must wash their clothes and bathe with water, and they will be unclean till evening. Whether it is the bed or anything she was sitting on, when anyone touches it, they will be unclean till evening. So we see from this reading that uh, somebody who was uh, having consistent menstrual breathing would be unable to take her place in society. Um, so therefore, she's almost condemned to leaving an isolated life. 
not allowed to worship, not allowed to mix with people, not allowed to pe for people to enter her home. And I suspect this was something that um, she couldn't keep a secret, especially after 12 years, people would know that she got a problem like this. And of course it made her always ceremonially unclean. And so she takes a big risk to come out and try and find Jesus and seeing him surrounded by many people feels the only way that she could get near him was just perhaps to touch her body. She had that sort of faith. I would imagine she was um, someone who'd heard about Jesus, heard about his miracles, heard about how he treated women. And so she put herself at great risk of coming out into the open and trying to get near him because I've no doubt that if the crowd had seen her and been able to identify her, they would have chased her away and caused a scene. But Jesus couldn't ignore her touch. This power that he had to heal people was something that he was very aware of. And the mere of her touching her just drained it away. But we know, of course, that Jesus was a very compassionate people. And so that's why he speaks up. He just couldn't let this go. He had to see who had touched him. So healing could be complete. Thankfully, the woman did own up. And Jesus, full of compassion, compassion calls her daughter which was a lovely way of addressing this woman. And by that almost gave her this cleansing. And it was done in front of a crowd. The crowd knew that he had healed her and therefore they could no longer take the stands of isolator from the community. The Tibbles say about this act, this act of public identification and affirmation is no mere appendix to the story, but the climax to it. Once a woman had been cleansed from her discharge, she was required to bring a couple of doves or pigeons to the priest who would offer them to make the atonement for her, and then she could be restored to a normal place within the community, according to the law of Leviticus. So in this public act of pronouncing her clean, Jesus acts as the priest who restores her, this woman to her rightful place in the community from which she had been banished for 12 years. He left others in no doubt that her ritual impurity and social stigma was ended and that she had the right to assume a full place in God's worshiping community. So it's a very touching incident a touching encounter Jesus had with this woman that points out that he was very compassionate and sympathetic for women as a whole and the difficulties that women experience that men would never experience. The second incident then, second encounter, is the woman who anoints Jesus's feet at the house of Simon the Pharisee. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town, who lived a sinful life, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him five hundred denarii, and the other fifty. 
Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So Sarim, Simon the Pharisee knew this woman and called her a sinner. What actually that means is that he was calling her a prostitute. He didn't want this woman in his house because he believed he would be defiling himself and his household. He believed she was contaminated with sin and that sin made him open to catch it. Such was the thinking of the way Pharisees thought in this era. Simon and of course their friends were horrified that Jesus would even let a woman of this background touch him. And they couldn't understand that she, he must have known about the reputation of this woman. So he was actually thinking that this prophet, so-called prophet, was really letting himself down because no decent prophet would allow such a woman to get anywhere near him. And he probably thought, well, I've got something against this young upstart now. But Jesus used a parable to deflate Simon, a story taken from everyday life, used to create a play or a drama to illustrate what he was trying to communicate. Jesus was trying to indica indicate that everybody sins and everybody has the ability to repent and be forgiven. But of course, those who sin big, big time are always likely to show their thankfulness for forgiveness more than those who only believe they sin a little. Of course, what we think was that, uh, you know, Simon thought he was very righteous and didn't need any forgiveness for sins at all, which, of course, was what Jesus is trying to point out. John Nolan, a Bible commentator, says this. The accidental fall of tears on Jesus' feet begins a change reaction. With nothing at hand to remove the offending tears, the woman makes use of her let down hair. The intimate proximity thereby creates, leads to a release of infectionate gratitude expressed in kissing the feet, which have just been cleaned from the dust of the journey in this unique and probably unintended manner. And the anointing of perfume, no doubt, intended for Jesus' head since this was only the place that people anointed people in Jewish custom, but finding no ready access thereto is spent on that part of the body for which the woman already has this intimate contact. This woman realizes that she's been a sinner and needs forgiveness. Unlike Simon, the Pharisee, the person the upstanding leader of the community who believes he's so righteous, but of course, in fact, he's so blind to the reality of the truth. So despite being in a man's house, Jesus engages with this woman in public. He accepts the scandalous past of this woman and forgives her. 
and then releases her from that label men had given her and it gives her hope for the future. Thirdly then, encounters with women is Jesus' encounter with the women, woman at the well. Let's remember that story. A Samaritan woman came to draw some water. Give me a drink of water. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. So how can you ask me for a drink? Jews will not use the same cups and bowls that Samaritans use. If you only knew what God gives, and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would ask him. And he would give you a life-giving water. Sir, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get that life-giving water? It was our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well. He and his children and his flocks all drank from it. You don't claim to be greater than Jacob, do you? Those who drink this water will get thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. So, a familiar story I suspect we're all aware of. Jesus encounters this Samaritan woman on her own in the middle of the day, his disciples having to go into town. And the question we would always ask in the background of this, why is this woman drawing water in the heat of the day? Obviously, she finds it very difficult to come up to the well when most of the other women would have done in the early morning when it wouldn't have been so hot. So Jesus knew that. But before he goes on, he appears to tease her a bit with the way he starts talking to her and asks her about her husband. Why does he do this? Well, he simply he needs to draw out the woman's spiritual condition in order that she can receive Jesus's forgiveness. So he confronts her with this domestic situation that she has many husbands and the husband she's living with now is not really her husband. But nevertheless, she is open to what Jesus is saying. She early on gathers that he is someone special. And so she starts off using the same tact as Jesus and tries to draw Jesus away by asking him about the fact of why can't they worship on Mount Gizim, you know, where their ancestors, Abraham and Jacob, etc., worshipped. And Jesus dismisses this and goes on to tell her the truth about who he is. In fact, by declaring that he's the Messiah, almost in very plain language, this Samaritan woman is the first person that Jesus really states very clearly who he is. He doesn't normally say that. Usually his language is very guarded and his teaching is very guarded. But this treating of this woman with dignity and respect, he doesn't condemn her for being a Samaritan or a woman who's uh, living uh, not with her husband. He shows compassion to this, brings her peace. He brings her healing. And what do you know? Before Jesus knows it, this woman is going round the town telling everybody about this encounter she has with this man who she believes is the Messiah. And Jesus spends some time in this town preaching and teaching with loads of people talking about the truth. Now, you remember, of course, Samaritans were a segregated race in the Jewish kingdom and suffer from per persecution and of for historical and theological distances, differences. But Jesus brings, a Jew brings the words of eternal life to them. And they accept it. This is quite amazing, really, that this woman 
who has got a far from the usual clean record, becomes a disciple and almost a missionary, we might call her, as she goes about the town, drawing everybody to come in. Jesus didn't treat women or Samaritans with any different way than he treated other people. They were all God's children. And this is what Jesus gets over in this passage. And especially he wanted to get on the fact that he dealt with first with a woman. And we only have to conclude that Jesus saw an opportunity here. Most people, when they're going from Galilee down to Jerusalem, which Jesus was doing, would avoid walking through Samaritan territory. He didn't. He took the 20 mile shortcut to walk straight through this for this specific encounter. The typical say of this encounter. We often speak of the need to judge a person not by what they say, but by what they do. In Jesus's case, what he says is personally consistent with what he does. Jesus treats the woman with dignity and respect as having real value and significance in God's sight. He shows them to be capable of receiving the full blessings of God's healing and peace for themselves without the need to be channeled through a man, or indeed we might add through a Jew. So this week in our encounters with Jesus's encounters with women, we looked at women suffering from bleeding, women who anoint Jesus's feet and women who are willing to offer Jesus water at the well. In these three examples we've looked at today, Jesus never ever treats these women as second-class citizens of the kingdom, as they are elsewhere in society. Jesus defies the normal rules that govern society's behavior he ignores all those unwritten regulations that gov govern the behavior between men and women. In a lot of these cases, these women became recipients of God's love and grace. Sins forgiven, healing takes place, peace is given into their lives, and they become fully paid up members of the kingdom, taking their place alongside men, proclaiming it and declaring it. Jesus' mission to the world was contrary to the cultural patriarchal system that dominates the world then, and unfortunately still dominates the world in lots of places where it shouldn't today. These missions of Jesus with these encounters with women clearly teach us that. So next time, which of course won't be next week because I'm not around next week, another encounter with Jesus and it will be women in the parables of Jesus.